when we talk about external and internal respiration within the respiratory system, respiration means one thing. It means gas exchange. That exchange between the body and the blood of O2 and CO2. This occurs at the and at the cells and tissues. So in this section we're going to be focusing on what's known as external respiration, gas transport, and internal respiration. In other words, talking about how we get the gas exchanged between the lungs and the blood, the transport between the lungs and the body, and then the gas exchange within the systemic capillaries. Now going back to the structures of the respiratory system, remember that the alveoli are the terminal component of the bronchioles. So the alveoli are these sac-like structures right here. Notice they are completely surrounded by capillaries. In other words, your lungs, like your liver and other parts of your body, are highly vascularized because the sole purpose of this area, the sole purpose of our lungs, is to get O2 in and CO2 out. In order to do that, you have to maintain a gradient. You have to have a difference in concentration. And that difference in concentration is two chemicals, oxygen and CO2. Now, remember that there is a constant amount of air within the alveoli. This was called the residual volume. That residual volume is what helps to maintain this difference in oxygen concentration. It helps to keep the oxygen levels in the alveoli always higher than the oxygen levels in the blood. So because of that, we see the flow of oxygen into the blood from the alveolar space. Conversely, CO2 out of the blood into the alveolar space. And so this exchange is a direct result of those concentration differences. This is what allows the blood to arrive oxygen poor and leave oxygen rich. It also allows it to arrive heavy in CO2 and leave it with much less CO2. And it's all because of this thin, we have this thin tissue right here between the blood completely surrounding it so you can see how the blood is literally surrounding these alveolar sacs and we get that exchange across the tissue. So diffusion is what drives everything, that difference in concentration. Now looking back you can see that we have various macrophages to help protect everything. In addition we have the surfactant which coats the gas exposed alveolar surfaces. So remember that the alveoli are covered in fluid this fluid is what helps to keep the alveoli protected, allows them to kind of move over and around each other, and to, in essence, kind of, whoops, back one more, maintain that general shape that we associated. So they are filled with fluid, covered in fluid, and so as the lungs themselves move and contract, these can move over and around each other and it acts like a lubricant as well as something that helps to keep them separated away, which is why under, if we fall into any kind of a positive feedback mechanism and they become clogged or closed or filled with fluid, it adds to that dead air space that we talked about in the previous section. Now, gas transport in the blood, we're talking about where and how. So both oxygen and CO2 attached to the red blood cells and are also carried within the plasma of the, of the blood. More O2 attaches to the hemoglobin than CO2 can attach to the hemoglobin, though some does, and a lot more of the CO2 is dissolved in the plasma as this bicarbonate ion. So we have this constant chemical reaction going on in our blood where the water in the CO2 forms carbonic acid, which you're already familiar with if you drink sodas. And some of that carbonic acid will separate into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. Now you should remember from earlier as well as previous classes, when we talk hydrogen ions, we're talking pH, we're talking acidity. Remember that the blood has to maintain a pH between 7.35 and 7.45, and it's this chemical reaction right here 
that helps to maintain this because this reaction basically acts as a buffer system. And all that a buffer does is help to absorb some hydrogen ions and produce some hydrogen ions. Basically what a buffer does is it maintains a constant pH. And it's this reaction that helps to keep our blood at an appropriate pH. Now, the internal respiration is what's actually occurring at the cells. So we have the opposite reaction of what's in the lungs. The CO2 diffuses out, the oxygen diffuses in. Again, this can only be due to a difference in concentration. In other words, you have to have a gradient. Gradients are always how diffusion can cause a mass movement in one direction or another. So, summary is you can see the difference in the amount of O2 and CO2 within the cells, within the blood, within the alveoli, within the blood. And so it's that gradient difference that allows that movement of CO2 out of the blood and movement of O2 in, and then at the cells, the actual reverse occurs. The other thing that's nice is it shows you the reaction. And so you can see how with modifications in the amount of CO2, we can actually change the pH of the blood. And it's this change in pH of the blood that is one of those external controls. It's one of those levels that is monitored in terms of our homeostasis to affect and change our breathing rate. Now, overall, when we talk about this, we're talking about the movement of air in and out. So we have air in, air out based on changes, physical changes to the lungs. We see the amount of O2 and CO2 that's inhaled, the amount of O2 and CO2 that's exhaled. So the CO2 changes dramatically. Notice that the O2, we even exhale some of our O2. Some of that is always maintained in the alveolar space. We have this constant movement of blood through the lungs, and then we have that exchange at the tissues. And you can see the differences in the levels of each gas in all areas. Now, lastly, in terms of controls, we have neural controls. So there's a couple of areas of the brain's direct, a couple of areas of the brain directly responsible for control of respiration, uh, the medulla oblongata and the pons. And remember, that the medulla is what was responsible for survival, those survival mechanisms that the body has to stay alive. And you can see that we have changes in CO2 that are monitored within the medulla. We can also monitor the amounts of oxygen. So we have actual chemoreceptors or chemosensors within the um, different parts of the body that help to control that. And so we have neural control and then we have these physical factors which changes in body temperature as we exercise, talking, coughing, consciously changing the amount of air we inhale or exhale, and then emotional factors, you know, that whole thing that happens when you panic and you tend to hyperventilate, etc. So all of this is monitored and controlled by the neural, by our nervous system. In addition, when we talk about the actual chemical factors that are monitored within the medulla and the pons, we're dealing with the actual carbon dioxide levels and the oxygen levels. And so these are monitored in two key areas, the carotid artery, which makes sense because that's going to our brain, and as the blood leaves the aorta. And then within CO2, again, since it has that buffering ability, changes in the pH can directly affect the medulla and so can then cause it to send a signal that will change the amount of contraction that will occur based on various stimulants like body temperature, exercise, coughing, etc.